So once again, um, I'd like to welcome you all here. There you are, Congressman. It's great to see you. Great to have your time with us this afternoon. We have a wonderful group of uh, after-school, summer, professional, youth-serving organizations gathered here together to, to talk with you and um, about what they're seeing for children, youth, and families all across the state. So thank you for making this time. Uh, we've gone through some of the logistics, uh, but I just want to say um, once again to, the, to this field that has been such a privilege to work with all of you. Um, you are truly a diverse and amazing field. Um, and while none of us would have chosen this COVID global pandemic path as a path that we wanted to be on, um, if I'm going to have to be on this path, that I'm, I'm glad that I'm on it with all of you and um, been able to be so inspired uh, by the important work that you've been doing um, and your grit and your perseverance uh, coming through every step of the way. Um, I think the other thing that has really come through and that we really appreciate is the way that you've approached every challenge um, that has arisen every day over the last 11 weeks um, in this problem solving mindset um, with an asset based approach. And it really reflects the work that you do do with children and youth, um, encouraging them to approach problems um, and challenges with that problem solving mindset and the asset based approach and it, and it comes through so strongly. So thank you uh, for being here and joining us this afternoon. Uh, thank you also, Congressman Welch. Uh, you have been a long time supporter of programs uh, for children and youth and after school and summer and teens and older youth and school age. Um, but, and we appreciate your leadership in the house um, and all that you've done uh, to support uh, Vermont children and youth and families. Um, thank you for being here. I'm going to turn it over to you to say a welcome and uh, update people on what, what you're hearing. Um, Holly, thank you so much. And uh, it's kind of you to thank me. But, uh, you know, the reality is you all are on the front line. Um, some folks might want to hit mute if they're not on so we don't get background noise. Um, you, Great. You know, uh, just what you said, Holly, is really striking me. N none of us would have picked this time. None of us want to anticipate it literally a once in a 102 year event. <clears throat> um, this, we haven't had a, a, an, an epidemic like this for literally 102 years. It was the Spanish flu and it was devastating. I mean, 600 lives were lost in uh, the United States. And that is at a time when the population of the United States was one third of what it is today. Uh, so it really swept uh, through the country and did in a couple of waves. And now we have uh, this pandemic uh, that's really serious, well over a million cases in, in uh, the United States and over 100,000 deaths. Uh, and it actually has been particularly devastating in the United States. We've suffered uh, our country one third of the deaths uh, attributed, attributable to COVID, even though our population is about 4% of the world population. So it's kind of a separate question about the response we had and the readiness we had and a lot of the uh, discussion about that is in Washington. But what we do know um, is that the step that was required to try to arrest the spread is social distancing, step number one. And the effect of that is that it turned the lights off on the economy, as you all know. And it's been extraordinarily disruptive for families, uh, for everybody, because we start out with that anxiety about whether we'll get it. For most of us, I think the real apprehension is, will somebody we'd love get it? Uh, for the work you do, the parents are terrified that one of their kids will get it. And uh, you have that anxiety. And then on top of it, uh, the enormous pressure uh, of in financial insecurity that is so much part of this. You know, Come earlier down. this. Yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but it's like you're wearing an invisibility cloak from Harry Potter. Like you're, we can see your chair, but we can't see you. I don't know if your camera flipped. Um, Oh, I, my, <laughs> my camera did flip. I, okay, there you are. All we could see was this chair, but there was no being in it. It was, it was, a, <laughs> it was very fun. It was kind of a neat no, trick. Just, 
<laughs> oh my god it was my it was my harry potter invisibility cloak <laughs> you look like, awesome. i like that i was oh very goodness. impressed i'm sorry right, to interrupt. Well, I, I don't know if the view is better with the camera on me or on the chair <laughs> but, on but i'll you. proceed but I was saying that I, I went to, you know, we all know that the guard uh, with the uh, Vermont Food Bank and uh, the Abbey Group are doing these food distributions at airports around. And I went to my first one today. And it's really stunning. I mean, people were showing up there at six o'clock when food was going to start to be distributed at 10 a.m. Uh, there were over 800 cars. Most cars are getting food for two or three families. Um, and I know in the work you do, you're just like on the ground aware of the reality of what it is for the families. The apprehension that uh, one of the people in their family will get sick, but the, and the financial insecurity now, I mean, we have fully 35% of Vermonters who want to work not working. And that happened like overnight. Uh, just to give a vivid example, I spoke to somebody who's got a restaurant group, and they went from Monday night having 240 employees to Tuesday having four. And of course, uh, so there, there is just immense anxiety. And people trying to figure out what to do, be at home, essential workers having to be at work, one of the things that is so much on everybody's mind is the well-being of their children. And you're doing God's work. I mean, these after-school programs are absolutely essential because in this sea of anxiety where the adults are doing their level best under great stress to keep it together and to give a sense of emotional uh, and, and physical security uh, to their kids, they need the help um, of professional providers like you. They've got, this is like essential what you're doing because the potential, my view, you know, I'm really interested in hearing from you on this, but I think the potential for trauma is significant. So how do you create this uh, kind of web of security around these children uh, who at a critical time in their life are going to get on the way to a healthy adulthood, or they're going to suffer something that results in some lasting impairment of their ability to reach their full potential. And we all know that with kids, it's like that attention, that emotional concern that comes from adults seeing them and being considerate of them and creating safe spaces for them that is so profoundly important. Uh, so I just wanna say uh, that my gratitude to you for the work you do is enormous. And uh, I see you as essential workers, absolutely. My job is to try to get some resources back uh, to you so you can do this absolutely critical work. And on that, effort bernie patrick and i are totally united our you know sometimes people say our job is hard because we look at what's going on in washington and we're all dismayed uh and uh and it is hard but it's it's not as hard as your work okay because you're day in and day out and the other thing that when we're being candid this is not something where this the switch is going to be flipped back on you know there this is going to be a, a, a long steady, uh, hopefully ultimately successful march back to normalcy. <clears throat> but it's going to take an ongoing commitment. And that's why, Holly, what you said, I think, is so right. We don't pick the times that we live in. What we do decide is whether to be engaged in doing our best to help those kids who, in ways they're not even aware of, that they need that help and that sense of security that a parent gets when they know there's some after school program and they have that period of time covered in their mind emotionally where they can just put at bay one of the worries about whether somebody's sick or put at bay uh, their financial worries because they actually are working then or they're doing something like going to the food bank to get some provisions for the for the for the week uh it 
is really important. So uh, I just uh, I want to express my gratitude. And I know we've got a lot of people on this call. And it always is so, uh, I think, special to all of us <clears throat> that in Vermont, we do, I think, kind of have Holly's attitude. But, you know, what do we got to do? We don't like the situation. But, you know, this is the situation. And let's go. So I thank you very much for that. And I look forward to our conversation. Uh, I just so you know, I have on the on the call here, uh, Rebecca Ellis, uh, who's my director here in the state, uh, and Lizzie Haskell, who uh, is is uh, one of my staff members and is totally <laughs> focused on uh, the concerns that you have. So I regard this as a beginning conversation. And our office is available anytime to do anything that can be helpful uh, to you doing the very, very important work that you do. So Holly, uh, I'll stop there and turn it back to you. Awesome, thank you so much. <coughs> so uh, refreshing and empowering to have a leader like yourself who understands you know, the context and the connections. Um, I think uh, Sam, I'm gonna ask Sam, because we had folks do a quick poll when they came on just to get a feel for what part of the state um, they're calling in from. Um, so the, here are the results. I hope everybody can wow. see it on your screen. Um, so nice um, diversity. Wow, yeah, that's um, good. Across, that's um, the second question uh, was what type of program? So school run, uh, after school or summer program, a community-based summer day camp, parks and rec, child care, teen programs, our community partner. And then uh, there was a quick question about challenges. So it really is, uh, and this is kind of what came through in those pre-registration questions, funding right. and financial concerns, as well as deciding when and how to reopen, right? That magic question that we all are hoping for answers um, to. So thank you, Sam, for sharing that. I think if we just hit close, that moves yeah. out. Um, I'd like to invite, uh, we're going to try a fishbowl panel. Um, so we're not looking for a series of mini presentations, but just to have, we have seven uh, directors who have volunteered or have been volunteered, <laughs> invited uh, to do this fishbowl discussion with us. And I'm going to ask uh, Beth Chambers, who's the director of the Encore program and the North Country School Supervisory Union up around Newport in the Northeast Kingdom, to start us off by talking about the contributions that uh, your program has made, Beth. Um, over the last 11 weeks in your communities? What does that look like and what have you been focused on? So uh, I liked hearing that, that quote kind of, what do we got to do? Because that's exactly what I felt like all after school program staff gathered together and said. So uh, we really spread out. Um, we have programs in nine different elementary schools, almost 170 staffed for over 1,200 children. And, uh, you know, we really immediately started spreading ourselves out. And so we had uh, a large number of staff who were making and delivering meals in all of our schools we spread out. Um, I was the point person for our essential child care and we had many of after school staff who were working in the three programs that we opened up for essential persons. And we offered some remote enrichment. So we sent 930 enrichment packs home to kids uh, that had over 16 activities per pack that were age appropriate. And wow. um, yeah, and they went out to all of the kids and they connected to two clubs. So we had over 20 different clubs that we offered in each pack connected to two clubs. And they could go online on our YouTube channel and see their own instructors from their own schools from Encore programs leading different clubs, and then they would have the supplies to do the enrichment activities. So we were really doing our best to stay connected. And I feel really grateful in RSU to all be staying on the same page. Um, we just, we really want families and our schools knowing that we're going to be there for them regardless. So through the summer, after school, next year, whatever we need to do, we're gonna be there. It's been amazing, Beth, to watch what you all are doing. Um, I'm wondering if Kim, Kim Peters is the superintendent of Rutland Recreation and Parks down in Rutland City. Kim, can you chime in sort of the from the town and recreation? Sure. sure. So um, a little bit of background. I'm actually from Cincinnati, Ohio, where I was a director of a YMCA. So when when the outbreak 
started um, 12, 13 weeks ago, I had a little bit of inside um, knowledge because Ohio was a little bit ahead of, of where we were at. So I reached out to my directors there and they had this idea of essential care um, out of their YMCA. So I picked up on that and said, I think we can do this. And I liked, um, I liked the comment of how do we just engage? Let's just engage, let's just do it. So I reached out to our schools and said, I think we can do this. Um, and so four of our supervisory unions um, relied on the REC to go ahead and provide essential care. So they provide the financial assistance. Um, and on another note, I'm very fortunate because we have facilities to be able to do this because the schools closed down, that wasn't really an option at that point. Um, so we opened our facilities up. We're currently renting the old College of St. Joe athletic facility. So with us closing that due to the pandemic, we were able to open essential care. Um, it has been phenomenal. I am so happy we did it because we were able to really see the future. Um, four weeks into it, um, I will be honest, I didn't sleep for probably the first two or three weeks starting it. Um, Beth, I'm sure I see you smiling, same. Um, I'm also very fortunate because my four kids are all high school, college kids. So I knew right away they would they would be our counselors. And then we picked two other. Um, <laughs> we also, <laughs> who cares if they get sick? But we also picked um, two sets of siblings, other siblings that were also cousins. So, you know, when, when this was first established, you know, we kept hearing the same, same social group. So we created the same social group with our counselors. They went through immense training of what we could create. Um, again, utilizing a little bit of what some of the YMCAs were doing. So we are into our 11th week. We had to add an additional site for essential care. Um, we, one thing I was extremely, um, and, and I, I repeat this, I, uh, we meet with the Vermont recs and directors um, every Tuesday. And so we've been doing that for about 10 weeks and I've been trying to get them to understand like, listen, this is doable. Um, <coughs> kids are great at washing their hands. They're great at, we're great at disinfecting, social distancing, not so much, but that's where the cloth masks come in. Um, so we're in a really fortunate position because of the facilities that we have and the staffing. And then to receive a stipend, um, we were one of the, the, the lucky ones that did receive one of the stipends. And that is that really puts a big um, you know, relief on me on how we can run. We're gonna run four sites versus just one. So that's how we were, so that means we need four of everything. Um, but that's where we're at. So how does that affect resources when you've got to have four sites instead of one? So again, getting receiving that stipend is it mm -hmm. just makes it easier. So I was on Amazon yesterday ordering everything I could. So yeah, it, it, that's it is. As far as um, staffing, I think again I'm a little fortunate because I have four kids that are in that age group that are counselors. I typically run with forty lifeguards in the summer. So a lot of them are gonna convert over to, um, to be counselors. And as far as somebody mentioned the, the extensive training, we did first aid CPR. Um, most of them were already certified. So we recertified them um, using individual mannequins. Um, and then the VOSHA training. Um, and then just looking at all the guidelines and putting together a uh, manual for our counselors, um, which will then we're now putting out to our family so they know what they're, what the risk they're taking coming in. That's great, Thank Kim. You. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would, I wonder of uh, Vanessa White, who's the director of Optical Programming at Two Rivers Supervisory Union, Ludlow, Mount Holly, Chester area. I wonder if you could talk about what you think is the most important thing you've learned over the last 10 weeks. Where did Vanessa go? I'm right. I'm right here. Sorry, there you are. I was muted and I went on. Okay. Um. So I have what I call like the three S's of what I've learned over the last um you know couple 
10 weeks. <laughs> they are staff systems and staying ahead of the game. Um, so the value of experienced and creative staff who are willing to go above and beyond for our students and communities. We've seen them jump into virtual programming with gusto and no idea what, what's even expected of them. Um, I also have a staff of 18 summer counselors who in many ways are being asked to give up their summer to not travel outside of the state, to follow all of the guidance all the time, even when they're not at work, um, so that we can provide a safe learning experience for our campers. Um, the second S would be the systems and how important they've been to our success in both the virtual world and in making plans and being able to commit to the summer. They have provided us the ability to lead food programs in our supervisory unions and communities in combination with our experience in childcare licensing regulations. And of course, the support we've received from Vermont After School and the AOE have all largely benefited Vermont youth. And I think the last S is pretty uh, self-explanatory. Like you just gotta stay, stay, stay ahead of the game at all times and kind of be a, have your little crystal ball as to what mm -hmm. you think is going to happen and just jump when you can jump. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Maria, how about you? So Maria is the director in the Wings Community Program and Halifax, Reesboro, Whitingham, and Wilmington. What's been your sort of biggest lessons learned? Yeah, so one of the most important things that I've learned is that flexibility and adaptability are really survival skills during this time. That yeah. There have been so many occasions that I, I can't even count when we've spent numerous hours working on designing, creating, brainstorming, only to have our plans brought to a screeching halt. And nevertheless, we've learned to persevere, to pick those pieces up wherever they are, to reevaluate, reroute, redirect our vision time and time again. Um, and I think the most recent example of this is when we've been planning for summer. We have spent endless hours working through every kink and detail to ensure that we could run the safest in-person camp possible. But in the end, our SU has made the final decision to not allow in-person programming this summer. And while we completely understand this dis decision, considering the health and safety risk, um, our plans were yet again upended and we had to completely shift gears. So while this is frustrating at times, um, I've learned that being flexible and adaptable is, is key and just to float with the current instead of fighting it. And you know what, that, I just want to interrupt on that. You know, we have, we're all going to have to live with this uncertainty because the extent to which we can start uh, social gathering has got to be based on not just when we'd like to. It's got to be when the data in the medical advice is that it's safe. So you've yeah. got to plan as though it'll be tomorrow, but right. be adaptable. So a uh, fair amount of emotional resilience required. But Absolutely. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. And on a more positive note, I think too that our flexibility and adaptability have truly cultivated this whole new level of creativity and innovation mm -hmm. in both myself and, and our wing staff as a whole. Um, and as a result of being flexible and adaptable, we have been able to reach and serve our youth in ways that we had never before dreamed possible. Mm -hmm. um, some examples like over April vacation, we were able to launch a virtual program camp and just the level of quality programming, the creativity and engagement that our virtual program leaders were able to offer just really still astounds me. It was, it was truly incredible. And we also were able to recognize our high school seniors through Project Warm and Fuzzy, in which we collected and sent out 240 <laughs> letters to our high school seniors uh, from their families, their friends, teachers, and other school staff. And we've been sending birthday cards out to students who've had birthdays during the school closure. Well, you know what I love about that is you're finding a way to acknowledge the, uh, the transition, you know, that uh, life moment. Uh, and, you know, normally it's the graduation. We've got our rituals that work um, right. and have for 102 years, but they don't work this year. Right. But on the other hand, the acknowledgement of the passage is as important. Um, yeah. And it puts a positive... Um, face on it so that the students who disappointed as they are that they weren't with each other for the final weeks and months, uh, they've got a solidarity based on this com common experience. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they were still recognized and valued. Yeah, so right. that was pretty amazing. Yeah, so just overall and reflecting on the past 10 or 11 weeks, um, the WING staff, my co-director Katie and myself, 
um, we've discovered that not only have we survived, um, but we've actually for thrived on being flexible and adaptable. Mm -hmm. well, good for you. It's great. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. Um, Mandy Chesley Park, um, you're the director of the Extended <coughs> Learning Program in Mount Abe Unified School District, Bristol area. Um, my question to you is how have your relationships with family and youth changed over the last several months? That, that's a great question, Holly, and I, I've been thinking and pondering that a lot since some of these, so, you know, we explored some of these questions. And I think one of the first things that we've identified is the fact that we were all kicked off our feet together. And so there was this collective sense of vulnerability that was fodder for some amazing things that have happened over the last 10 weeks at our essential child care program. Um, all of a sudden, just like you were saying, Peter, right, we all became kind of essential together. Mm -hmm. And over the last 11 weeks, you know, almost 11 weeks, we have served almost every um, worker on that essential worker list. And, you know, it changed. It evolved as we went along. But um, we were able to open to two additional school districts as well in a hospital community and one of those and it was, this, it was this great equalizer and this great um, unifying force that brought us all together. And especially those first couple of weeks, it was that, that shared feeling of the rest of our, um, our neighbors are doing their civic duty by staying at home <laughs> and not, right. you know, not going out. That's right. And so, and here we are, here we are together. And it kind of felt like, you know, we're, we're moving, we're navigating, or someone has said we're building this, um, this plane while we're flying it. And it was and continues to be um, an environment where we have built relationships and community that will continue for years after this. Um, you know, the other piece is that we've always, you know, summer and after school, we're, we've always been this kind of um, this bridge, or I kind of think of it as this triangle between school and family and community. And we always triangulate and draw these. Um, these different stakeholders into a, a central focal point. Well, I feel like during this, we kind of became a uh, Pentagon and we added a couple more points to our shape. And, and I like that idea too, because that's kind of the shape of a house and it, and it, it kind of suits us. Um, but we had our school and we had family and we had community and then we added state. Like the Vermont became a huge presence in what we were doing in Vermont government. And then of course, healthcare. Um, we added nurses into our staff. We were directly plugged into Vermont Department of Health. And so even more so, we became this, um, this like fertile soil for, for holistic health for families and, we've, and community and staff. And we've always felt like that's what we were doing. It just added layers and added um, even more shades to the work we're doing. And also, I think, surprised us all a little bit. Maybe you would have told us this already, Peter. Maybe you've already seen that this is who we are. But it was a real... Um, the opposite of an identity crisis. And it was like, wow, this is who we Embracing. are. Embracing. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so that's, that's become powerful. And I, I don't, you know, I see that this will just strengthen the work that we've always done. Well, thank you very much. You're thank still you. smiling. <laughs> she yeah. is. She's been smiling the whole way. <laughs> She's been very well, yeah, you're right. We have to, we have to. <laughs> I want to um, come back up to Burlington and ask Christy Galise, who's the Director of Expanded Learning for the Burlington School District, uh, to talk a little bit about sort of the challenges when you look forward. What's the biggest challenge you're facing um, at this moment? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, you know, I think I always try to look at our challenges as more of opportunities. And certainly for, for right now, we're really seeing, again, that continued importance for summer learning programming and how it's going to be more important now than ever. So how can we continue to be innovative and adaptive? Um, and I think really the challenge is meeting and prioritizing the really diverse needs of all of our stakeholders during this time and how that can come together through summer. So we have our students who we know are in a huge need to be in a place um, where they're supported and safe. Our, our staff, our families, our English language families and how we're communicating with them, our community partners, how mm -hmm. we're aligning with our extended school year services programs. Um, 
and our district teams, thinking of even the property services group within our school district and how we can kind of meet them in the middle too so that everyone can feel like they're doing the steps they need to make the work happen. Um, and then also really seeing how we can continue to support our essential worker families um, that were the, the childcare program. So I think, mm -hmm. Those are a lot of the different pieces. It's a puzzle and putting so it like together. How many, how many students do you have? How many people in your program? In a, in a typical summer, we have around 500 students. So 200 elementary students and five, uh, 300 middle school students. And we're looking at, right. unfortunately, we're going to have to reduce that capacity to about half for the summer. And really knowing that that's hard to do when right now we know more students are going to need access and, and support. Um, so really, how do we how do we continue to wrap our arms around our families while kind of ensuring the the safety, security, and health of of everyone? Um, and and I think also looking forward, um, being prepared to restart the school year and provide mm -hmm. kind of that critical space that after school is. So really balancing mm -hmm. all of those competing priorities because each one is is really important. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Um, Carrie McDonald, um, who's the director of the One Planet Program and the White River Valley Supervisory Union, so South Royalton, Sharon, Tunbridge, that whole area. Um, Carrie, I wonder if you would talk about your plans for the summer, um, what you've learned um, as you've been doing that planning, and what you're looking at going forward. Uh -huh. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so obviously our summer is going to look very different than um, any summer program we've offered before. Um, we're thinking about uh, the isolation that students have been experiencing and really thinking about focusing mm. on um, their social emotional needs and um, kind of building that sense of belonging again and building their confidence in their social and emotional skills. A lot of that I think has been lost over the last few months for mm -hmm. um, a good portion of our kids. Um, we're also thinking about, we are a school-based program, so we view this summer as a trial run for the school year. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be introducing our kids to new behaviors and new mindsets so that they're better prepared for the fall. Um, we're looking, or we're working closely with the uh, principals around the way we address the CDC guidelines. Um, so at the end of the summer, we can report back to principals and say, this is what we did and it worked really well, or we tried this and it didn't work very well. Um, I mean, you can implement the CDC guidelines in a way that will make school feel like prison. <laughs> or right. You can be really thoughtful and creative and implement these guidelines in a way that keeps kids safe, but um, honors their social and emotional and physical needs. Um, yeah, and that's going to take a lot of thought and a lot of uh, care. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I'm interested in your, I, sorry to interrupt, but the, the sense of isolation. I remember as a kid in the summer, um, when I wasn't going to school and have structured activities and playing sports and stuff, um, I used to feel pretty lonely. And I imagine that for a lot of kids, if they, they don't have that ability to get together and they've got to be, so they, they've got to go through the distancing the rest of us are going through. I mean, that does sound like a very, very significant challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, our hope is that, you know, we can introduce some of these new behaviors and mindsets in a way that is supportive so that they're not so scary and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of wearing mm -hmm. a mask, it seems kind of scary, but if you introduce it in a way, um, in, the, in, a, in the right way, I guess, um, kids just, they accept it. They understand. You can it. normalize it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I wanted to um, invite the panel, um, kind of our, our last question for the panel was, you know, what do you hope that policymakers are thinking about um, as they pass the bills and consider bills and make funding decisions um, during COVID recovery? And I wonder if uh, Vanessa, if you had some thoughts on that. I do. 
I, I want to recognize the fact that I know that I'm kind of preaching to the choir that that you're from Vermont and that you you understand how rural we are so and that and that you will continue to fight for us but I'm I'm deeply concerned about the number of federal funds that are going to large cities in our country while leaving behind the small rural communities living mm -hmm. in Vermont oh we, yeah living in Vermont we don't have a single city of half a million people so we're not we're not getting a lot of dough right now um, right. But we do have a lot of families living in poverty. We do have a lot of struggling working families. We do have a lot of students whose parents are small business owners who we know have taken a hit. Um, mm -hmm. And we we know that rural poverty is is big and grand and it, and it, it, it shouldn't be only large cities. So um, I ask that policymakers realize that most of our programs are supported in a large capacity by local funding. So as the state education fund is ex is expecting millions and millions upon millions in shortfall, our local programs um, are going to be on the chopping blocks from our local school districts as they try to scurry and gather money. What right. money after school did have um, is at risk of being lost. So um, I think it's just really vital for to not only support the after school program funding, but that the federal government needs to continue to support um, our small rural public schools mm -hmm. that because if if the, if all of our school systems can't afford after school and we're only surviving on federal funds, like we're just going to have to cut more stuff. And so I want to, you know, I, you, I know you're right, and, and, and actually, let me just speak to that a minute, because one of the big debates we're now starting to have is state and local aid, and um, it is so important that Congress get that aid to Vermont and to the community so that there's at least a shot in Montpelier that they can continue funding your important programs. You know, at the federal level, I don't think we can micromanage. But the fact is rural America has special challenges that you've outlined. And if we don't get the money back to Vermont, then there's gonna be no choice for the taxpayers. You know, that they'll be up against the wall. And of course, that means the in in extraordinarily important service that you're providing to the kids uh, would be in jeopardy. Now in the HEROES Act that we passed in the House, uh, we would have $1.3 billion coming back to Vermont next year and $1.4 billion the year after. And in addition to that, well over $400 million it would be distributed to the communities, including small communities. So it would give some breathing room. And this is where we're now starting to have a debate with Senator McConnell in the Senate, who his view is that let the states declare bankruptcy, uh, which is basically let the kids survive on their own. You know what I mean? Uh, let them sink. And I, we've got to get that through. Uh, and then that gives, as I say, the opportunity for you to work with folks in Montpelier uh, to find a way to keep you, uh, keep you, ro to keep you going. Um, so I know Bernie, Patrick, and I are on the same page on this, okay? And we'll do all we can. But thank you for the work you do. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Christy. Did you have something you'd like to add here about policy? Yeah, absolutely. I think you just hit on that piece of really, I think, ensuring that a lot of the response um, and recovery legislation does prioritize young people. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a critical component in how that comes to play out. I think the ongoing support that has been provided to the 21C programs has been critical, um, but then also this additional layer for, for many of our programs um, to write additional supports for things like supplies um, and the other items that are going to be necessary to meet a lot of the guidelines, um, having access to funding for supplies, longer hours for staff, and how we can compensate that, that those are kind mm -hmm. of critical pieces to be looped into a lot of that ongoing funding and, and that's a piece that we need to see. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. There, there were many questions, Congressman, that came in through registr registrants about funding. Um, the field is so diverse. There's a number, you know, there's the 21st Century Community Learning Center funding, there's, which is really strong and very important in Vermont. There's the Child Care Development Fund, which is funding many of these programs. There's the local town funds uh, for the recreation programs. There's parent fees. 
Uh, there's grants and arts programming and science programming all across the state. And it's hard to find um, a single source for our field that is able to reach all the programs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have to work all these different right. angles and all these different committees. Um, and it's hard, so if, yeah. Yeah, any, if there's any way, you know, to keep that in mind, it's like Christy's saying with this overall overarching priority for our children and youth. Um, and in what you, what you drew out at the beginning about this period of time is gonna have a strong impact on our kids and right. not always yeah. a good one. Um, you know, so how do we come out of this in a different place with different priorities um, that really don't take us another 20 years to get back to where we were? Um, right. So That's right. Happen. That's absolutely critical. And we've got to be energetic and relentless uh, in this. Yeah. And any, any stories that you need from us and the field, everybody that's on here that helps make the case in Washington, uh, you know, please reach out and let us know because we've got plenty of data and plenty of stories um, for what's happening. In well, I do. I do know that. And Lizzie and Rebecca and I will, you know, be in regular touch with you. Um, but, you know, your work, your work is so important and we can't let it go. And your attitude is exactly right. This is the time we're in. We've got to face it. Let's do it. Um, and I, you know, the, 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 I can't remember who was talking about the flexibility and adaptability of the kids, but they'll be adaptable if we give them security, okay? But that's what we have to provide somehow, even in these more difficult circumstances. Yeah, great point. I wanna invite um, all participants, I'm gonna have Sam could start the second poll um, as we move into the Q&A section. Um, the second poll was asking about sort of what you're thinking about, what you're concerned about. Um, so if you could just take a few minutes to, to answer the poll questions, um, we'll gather that input and switch to some question and answers. All right, two more seconds. People's faces look pretty intense, so I'm gonna give you a second to finish reading through the questions. <laughs> um, yeah, Danielle had a good point um, about technology. I'm just reacting to the chat. Um, you know, technology, I know that's something that you've worked on a lot, Congressman, and that came through in the questions right. and concerns and unequal access to technology. There's also a lot of concerns about will kids be able to keep their devices over the summer um, mm -hmm. so the programs can reach out to them or not. Um, that's something that's been coming through a lot. What, what is the story about kids and their devices? I don't know the answer to that. As um, Maria, thank you. So, um, pick up, I'm sorry, Holly. Uh, Maria, can you go ahead? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we don't have a definitive answer on that yet. Um, we are moving forward with virtual programming because our SU has decided not to do in person. Um, so we've been working in collaboration with our task force, the superintendent and the principals to come up with a plan um, to make sure that devices um, return to the schools once school is dismissed, um, get cleaned, updated, whatever needs to happen to the devices, and then we can get them hopefully back into the hands of the students that sign up mm -hmm. for, our, for our virtual summer camp. Mm -hmm. but, they, but they really have to have, right? I mean, yeah. Just can't yeah. Do it yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an access and equity issue. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it, it once again shows that connection between schools and out of school time um, that has to be so tight um, and how much work directors have to do to right. keep those relationships going. Yeah. Sam, are you able to show the results of the poll? Ah. All right, so supplies um, and training around health in particular and funding are still rising to the top. Um, the state is working on supplies. Uh, 
I will say we have bar soap <laughs> for summer programs, <laughs> 12,000 bars of it. So watch for some notices coming out. We got to figure out how to get the soap to all of you. Um, but we know it's going to take more than that. Um, let's see, representative program offering. So quite 44%. I can't tell you how glad I am to see that. Um, this, the issue about summer programming and childcare has been often talked about as an economic issue in Vermont, which it is for working families, but it is also really, most importantly, a child and youth development issue um, for all the reasons that we've spoken about uh, loneliness and disconnection. So, um, and I, uh, so that's so important to be able to do. And, and those that are also picking up the mixed online and in person, um, that's, that's great. Um, and the most worried is physical distancing and masks. Um, that's so interesting. See that come in. Um, Congressman, I, what are you hearing about supply? So we're hearing that the uh, state's PPE. Can't even, yeah, PPE, are, cleaning supplies. Well, there's there's two issues on supplies, especially. Are you are you are you talking about the PPE supplies or which particular supplies? The P, yeah, the, the hand sanitizer and the masks and the soap and um, and so forth that programs need to well, run. Well, there's a, the number one Congress has appropriated the money for it. Uh, and the question is the supply. I mean, one of the reasons we, um, that things got out of control here is that we, when we went, there's a strategic national stockpile for medical supplies which uh, we're in desperate need, particularly among our hospitals. And we went to check the cupboard. It, it was bare, you know, and there was a real failure at the federal government level to keep that stocked. The second thing is that a lot of these supplies we need for um, uh, the PPE in particular, they're manufactured in China. And of course, we, we don't manufacture them here. So we had a big argument in Congress about using the national emergency authority that the president has to require that our companies here manufacture the things that we need immediately to meet a national emergency. Um, and that ultimately was invoked, but it was slow to happen. So we have a situation where the money is appropriated, but the supplies are being purchased but there's a lack of centralization in terms of the disbursement. Uh, and this is a dispute we're having with the Trump administration. So the exact status here in Vermont, I don't know what it is, but we had a lot of, I would say a calamity with uh, supply production because you had governors uh, who desperately were trying to get the supplies for the, their state, but they had to compete with one another as opposed to have a FEMA like, you know, emergency management administration type organization where obviously in the beginning when the big issue was New York, we need to get more there. So uh, I don't know exactly where, what the status is with supplies, but we can follow up with you. Um, Lizzie or uh, Rebecca can get back to you. Uh, but you need it all for each of your individual programs, right? Yes. Thank where you. Are you where do you get your supplies now? Um, not, what people have been doing is um, getting them independently. Um, Carrie, do you I want to talk about supplies? We've been told at the state level that the um, that the supply chains are like broken. There's like there's that's there's, correct. Yeah, you go to get something and it's not there. Um, right. They're they're completely out, and that will make it impossible to open. Right. Carrie, sure. Holly, let me say, um, yeah, we're finding that we have to piece these things together, that not any one vendor is able to provide all of these things. Um, a lot of distilleries are producing hand sanitizer locally in Vermont, so we that's where we're getting our hand sanitizer. We've got another, um, I think it's a t-shirt company that is that makes the um, buffs. So we're using for um, face coverings. Uh, so yeah, we're just kind of piecing it together. It's not easy, but um, mm -hmm. we're getting there. That's hard though. Congressman, in the few minutes we have left, I know two issues that you have also followed are food insecurity 
and right. access to technology. And those the questions and concerns about those two areas came up a lot from people as they registered. I wonder if you could um, share a little bit about what you've been working on and seeing. Well, there. I'll tell you, it's a good day to ask me about food insecurity. When I just came back from Lindenville and I saw those 800 cars in representing, as I say, about 2,000 families in, in the St. Johnsbury area uh, coming to get uh, the food. And the, that issue is that, that food insecurity, one of the Vermont Food Bank folks told me the demand is like 50% higher than it's ever been. And their anticipation is that's gonna continue. Uh, there's the usual fight in Congress on this when there should be just a unity in Congress on this. In the HEROES Act, we increased uh, the, the food programs by so everybody in it would get 15% more, uh, which would be more food, more nutrition, more health. And uh, believe me, I think that's absolutely essential. Um, we're having, we have to get that through the Senate where it's a tougher, uh, it's a tougher slog. Uh, so it's very much on the forefront of uh, Bernie Patrick and in uh, my minds, and we'll keep advocating for it. And one of the things that makes me advocate for it so fiercely, it's not just the need, it's the extraordinary delivery system that we have here. I mean, today we have the Abbey Group, which is a private uh, food uh, uh, delivery operation and, and re restaurant group, but then you have the food bank um, and you had the guard and the logistics that go into getting that food to the person who needs it uh, is complicated, but we've got in place this, this system that's public and private. And we've got a lot of folks in Vermont who are supplementing the federal money with contributions to the food bank. So I have enormous uh, recognition of A, the need, but B, a reliable delivery system. So uh, how much more will we be able to get uh, as much as we can, we push as hard as we can, and we won't stop. On technology, uh, the internet, the argument that we've been making in Vermont is that the internet is, it's long, it's been a long time since it's become a necessity. It's not an option. And this is one area where I actually have good working relationships with many of my Republican colleagues. Many of them represent rural America. So, if I get off of the topic of Trump or what the tweet of the day is, and I talk to them about their rural hospital or I talk to them about how their schools have internet or what their kids are doing for homework, then their problems in those places are identical to our problems. So we're really making a push that internet at the federal level, we have to provide the ways and means so that we do with internet what this country did in the 1930s with electricity. And that is get that electricity out to that farm on the farthest end of the dirt road. Uh, and, and, and my hope is that we'll succeed in that because this crisis has made it clear that you need the internet, not just to do homework, you need it to go to school. Uh, you need the internet, not just so you can do a little bit of, of your work at home, you need it so you can work at home. And we've seen the internet is absolutely essential to the delivery of medicine through telemedicine. So uh, we're all in on that effort. It's not gonna be like overnight, but there is immense and growing pressure and re recognition that, that has to be part of the outcome of this. Awesome. Thank you. I know we're coming up on 2.30. I'm wondering if you have any last questions for the field or comments that you'd like to share? Well, look, Sure, I, the comment is, God bless you. <laughs> I mean, I'm so grateful to you. And I just wish so many more Vermonters could have been on this call to experience what I've experienced with uh, extremely competent, uh, extremely uh, caring, uh, and extremely hardworking people that are looking after the well being of our kids. Uh, I mean, it just like uh, instills confidence and humility in all of us, because whatever the challenges are each of us face, we know that others have more at stake. The other thing that I think is so wonderful for you, and I saw this come through in everyone who commented, we don't like COVID, we wish it weren't here, but we feel lucky if we have a job that allows us to try to help folks get through it. 
And that spirit of service that each of you has uh, was very compelling uh, to me. So thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Um, everyone, if you still had questions that we didn't get to, um, feel free to email Nicole. Um, she sent you the link to the session this morning and we will pull those together and get them to Congressman Welch's office um, and let them know if there's topics we haven't touched on or stories that you want to share or tell. She just put her email in the chat there because um, we want to make sure um, in an hour, it's hard to get everybody heard. Uh, so we tried as many different ways as we could, um, but we wanna make sure that, that all of you have a chance to share what you wanna share. Um, so thank you again for all for being here. Uh, thank you to the panelists for helping um, lead the discussion. And thank you to Congressman Peter Welch for, um, for asking for this forum and, and showing yes, up and coming for the programs. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.